A new deadly virus is exterminating people in droves. The country has been fenced off with a huge wall, and they won't let the infected out. The Reaper virus is spreading rapidly across Scotland. It wipes out thousands of people in a week. The country is quarantined and the borders are closed to keep the virus from spreading, but many head for the fence to get out of the infected area. Suddenly, the military notices a man with signs of the disease in the crowd and shoots him. The infected fluid spills onto other people. The refugees, enraged, attack the military and try to break through the fences, and the soldiers retaliate by shooting at the crowd. The huge border gate closes, and now a 9-meter wall divides the country in half. Catherine and her young daughter also try to escape, but a bullet hits the unfortunate girl in the eye. The mother sees a military helicopter and begs the soldiers to save her daughter. The last soldiers withdraw from the contaminated area, abandoning the people to their fate. Henceforth, a wall that stretches along the border shields Scotland from the rest of the world. The military shoots anyone who comes close to the wall. Gradually, all the people left in the quarantine zone turn into savages, marauders, and cannibals. Consigning the country north of the wall, first to memory. Britain sinks into total poverty, for the other nations now treat it as it treats Scotland. 27 years pass, Eden Sinclair, a rescued girl, becomes a major in a special forces unit. She replaces the eye she lost as a child with a prosthesis with a built-in camera that can even work outside her body and transmit data to a wrist device. Eden leads a raid on a ship of a slave trader named Richter. Sinclair and her partner John Michelson infiltrate the ship and separate. At the same time, Richter is conducting a deal with the buyers, but suddenly Michelson gives himself away. Richter shoots the customers and takes John hostage. Eden casts her electronic eye into the hallway to assess the situation, then comes out from around the corner and points the gun at Richter. The slave trader threatens to shoot her partner if she doesn't stop. Eden, however, continues to walk forward and keep her gun on the criminal. Out of the blue, things go awry for Richter. Now there's nothing to stop Sinclair from opening fire on the slave trafficker. After the operation is over, Eden looks at the note her mother left her 27 years ago. Sinclair is approached by her superior, Captain Bill Nelson, and wants details of what happened on the ship. Eden gives him a disc with a video recorded by the eye. I'll never get used to that. Nelson calls attention to her old note, and Eden regrets forgetting her mother's face and never being able to go to the address on the note. The captain warns Sinclair that working too hard is bad for her health and advises her to get some rest. Soon the security service is conducting another raid on a drug joint. The cops accidentally discover a room full of infected people covered in gruesome sores. It's the Reaper virus. Oh my god. It's back. High-ranking official Michael Canaris, along with Prime Minister John Hatcher, convene an emergency briefing to develop a plan of action to combat the virus. The ministers suggest flooding all canals around London, closing bridges and thus isolating the city from the outside world. However, Captain Nelson warns that even rumors of the virus spreading again will devastate the city, and the bodies of the infected in the streets will cause uncontrollable panic in the population. There'll be panic, public disorder, looting, rape, murder. After the meeting, Hatcher and Kanara show Nelson images from the spy satellite through which the government has been monitoring what is happening in Glasgow and Edinburgh. For years the satellite recorded no activity in the abandoned cities. Three years ago, however, everything changed. People were seen on the streets of Glasgow. Canaris is sure that if there were survivors, a vaccine must have been invented behind the wall. Bill Nelson is assigned to assemble a team of top agents who will infiltrate the restricted area, find the vaccine, and get it to London as quickly as possible. No, sir, I just fit the bill. Nelson summons Sinclair and brings her to Canaris, explaining the nature of the task at hand along the way. Before getting out of the car, Eden gives Bill the note from her mother and asks him to keep it. Michael Canaris reveals that Dr. Marcus Kane was researching the Reaper virus before the quarantine was imposed, and his lab was at the Glasgow Hospital for Infectious Diseases. Canaris is convinced that only Kane could have developed the vaccine and advises Sinclair to begin her search with his lab. Sinclair and her team have only 48 hours to conduct the covert operation. If it's there, I'll find it. Meanwhile, London's residents are already furious about the harsh quarantine measures. The riots Nelson warned about are starting to occur. Hatcher consults with Canaris, hoping to solve the problem. However, Canaris suggests that the quarantine zone should not be evacuated. He believes that the more people they save, the more likely the epidemic will reoccur. Soon Sinclair arrives at the wall at the Scottish border. Here she meets her team, Sergeant Norton, Corporals Chandler, and Reed, Rifleman Miller and Carpenter. They tell Major Sinclair about the equipment and weapons that have been prepared for the operation. Also on the team are two military doctors, Talbot and Sterling, 
who previously worked at the Reaper Virus Research Center. The military opens the welded gate, and the task force enters the restricted area in two armored vehicles. The team has no idea what they will face behind the wall. On the way to Glasgow, Dr. Talbot plays recordings of radio messages from Dr. Kane, who has held the hospital up to the last minute. In the messages, he recounts the terrifying transformation of the city and its inhabitants. Upon reaching their destination, the team enters the abandoned hospital and cautiously moves through the building in search of Kane's lab. Suddenly, Chandler spots a live girl in front of the armored car and informs Sinclair. The Major orders him not to go near her, as she may be infected. However, Chandler believes that the survivor needs help. The corporal approaches her, after which the exhausted girl falls into his arms. Dr. Talbot offers to isolate and examine her, and Chandler carries her to the car. Finally, the special unit finds the lab, but suddenly they are attacked by a group of violent and aggressive savages. A fierce battle ensues, which Carpenter unfortunately does not survive. Furthermore, the savages start throwing Molotov cocktails at the armored vehicles. Chandler and Reed try to escape the danger and pull out to the back exit. Suddenly, the girl Chandler picked up regains consciousness and slits his throat. A car crashes into the building, but Chandler manages to blow it up with a grenade. The savages continue to attack the remaining team members. Sinclair decides to leave the hospital in the elevator. Eden shoots the cable and detonates a foam grenade right in the shaft, which cushions the fall. Corporal Reed picks up Major Sinclair, Sergeant Norton and both doctors in the armored car. However, the throngs of mad marauders are not planning on stopping. One of the savages shoots Reed with a crossbow. The girl loses control and the car overturns. The remaining team members get out of the armored car and return fire. But soon they run out of ammunition and the savages get closer. Miller is slaughtered by the mob. Norton and Sterling manage to escape, while Eden and the injured Dr. Talbot are captured by the marauders. Sinclair comes to his senses as a prisoner of the leader of the savages, a deranged sadist named Saul. The psychopath beats Eden and wants to know who she is and where she came from. The tortured Sinclair confesses that she is from behind the wall. Saul becomes convinced that Cain was lying when he said there is nothing behind the wall. Now Saul hopes to get out of the zone, thanks to Eden, who can get them out of here alive. Saul orders his men to keep an eye on Eden and warns them that they need her alive. Saul's girlfriend, nicknamed Viper, takes Eden's GPS beacon, which Canaris gave her before she was sent to the zone, and crushes it with her boot. Meanwhile, the savages are having a party. After songs, dances, and various shows, Saul makes an emotional speech on stage. He declares that neither Cain nor anyone else can tell them what to do and that they are always ready to catch, fry and eat any outsider. This is our city! And this crazy party ends with a special feast. Saul throws many paper plates into the crowd, and Dr. Talbot is brought to the center of the arena. The man is roasted alive to the cheers of the crowd. Viper slices the doctor's body into small pieces and the mad cannibals devour their prey. Meanwhile, Eden devises a plan to escape her confinement. She pulls a wire from the broken GPS beacon and uses it to unlock her handcuffs. Soon a guard appears and brings her a piece of Talbot's remains. Sinclair pretends that she doesn't mind a taste of human flesh and asks for a drink. The guard comes closer to the door, and Sinclair grabs him by the chain connecting the rings in his nose and ear and forces him to let her out. Eden makes her way out of the cell and dispatches the guards with their own weapons. A girl from the next cell named Kelly begs for help. Sinclair hesitates, but Kelly reveals that Kane is her father. The girl promises to help find him if Eden sets her free. Suddenly Eden is attacked by Viper, armed with two swords. Sinclair deftly dodges the attack. During the fight, Eden manages to snatch one of Viper's swords and they continue fighting on equal footing. Suddenly Kelly grabs Viper by the hair. Eden seizes the perfect opportunity and cuts off Viper's arm and head. You can let go now. Move it! <gasps> After escaping from the prison, Eden contacts Norton and Sterling and arranges to meet them at the train station. Soon Saul discovers that Eden has escaped and orders his men to find her. As Norton and Sterling emerge from hiding, they are spotted by savages on motorcycles and a bus and begin their pursuit. Norton and Sterling rush to the train station, where Eden and Kelly and her friend named Joshua are already waiting for them. The guy starts the train ahead of time, without waiting for Norton and Sterling, in order to escape the approaching marauders and leave town. The train departs and the men are forced to run after it, dodging attacks from the savages. Norton manages to jump into the wagon, and Sinclair decides to help Sterling. She gets off the train and hits one of the motorcyclists with an axe. At the last moment, Sinclair and Sterling manage to jump onto the train. After a while, Kelly informs her that she can only help find Kane, but not take her to him. The girl is sure her father will eliminate her. Saul betrayed him once, and now Kane is suspicious of everyone. He will surely want to get rid of Eden and her crew, for they came from behind the wall. If his people find out about this, they will realize that Kane is a liar. 
Also, Kelly admits that crazy cannibal Saul is Kane's son and her brother. That is one fucked up family man. The team gets off the train and travels a long way to get to an abandoned military base. Kelly and Joshua explain to the others that this is the way to get to the other side of the woods and enter Kane's land. Once in the dense woods, Kelly and Joshua hear rustling and realize that the executioner Telemann, Kane's right-hand man, is about to arrive. They, along with Sterling, flee, while Sinclair and Norton decide to stay put. Kane's men appear in the woods, looking, much to Eden's surprise, like medieval horsemen in armor with bows and spears. Kelly, Joshua, and Sterling fail to escape. Joshua is shot with an arrow and the others are taken prisoner. Eden and her companions are taken to the ancient castle of Kane, who has proclaimed himself King of Scotland and restored medieval culture to his lands. Kane explains that he knew the towns would be watched, so he chose this place away from prying eyes. He also knew that one day they would come from behind the wall to find out how they had managed to survive. However, Kane disappoints the guests, there is no vaccine, and they owe their survival to natural selection. Eden informs Kane that the Reaper virus is back, but the man is outraged that the government has dared to ask him for help. They started this fire, they can burn in it. Meanwhile, in London, thousands of people are dying from the horrible virus. One of the infected infiltrates a government building and uses an axe to massacre a security guard. The man bypasses all security systems with his severed arm and head. The infected man infiltrates Prime Minister Hatcher's office, but Nelson manages to shoot him. However, the infected fluid gets on Hatcher's face, and Canaris orders him to be isolated in his office, where the Prime Minister shoots himself in the head. Kane has no intention of losing power over his kingdom, so he plans to execute the intruders from behind the wall. In addition, he severely punishes his daughter for bringing outsiders here and brandishes her with a red-hot iron. For Eden, Kane prepares a special test, she must fight the heavily armed Telemann with her bare hands. Crowds of spectators gather in the arena to enjoy the monstrous spectacle. Sinclair manages to dodge the warrior's huge spear and even attacks his opponent in return. Eden snatches a weapon from one of the guards and attacks Telemann before piercing his helmet with a powerful axe strike. At the same time, Norton, Sterling and Kelly escape from their confinement by attacking the guards and locking them in their own cell. Kane is furious at Telemann's unexpected defeat and orders the immediate execution of the prisoners. Norton, Sterling, and Kelly, however, gain time for escape. They use the seized weapons to take out Kane's men and escape the castle. Kane orders his marksman to finish off Eden, but she is saved by Norton, who shoots the warrior. The captives leave Kane's lands on horseback and head for the military installation, while the knights continue to pursue them. Inside the secret base, they try to find something useful and unexpectedly discover a new Bentley. While Sterling fuels the car, Eden finds a phone. Norton falls back to close the gate and prevent the knights from pursuing them. However, the warriors shoot Norton with a bow and he unfortunately does not survive. Eden, Sterling, and Kelly successfully evade the chase, leave the base, and drive out onto the highway. Sinclair calls Nelson and tells him that the mission is complete. Nelson hands the phone to Canaris, and Eden offers to track their whereabouts on the phone signal. Suddenly they start being chased by savages in a police car. Eden dodges the car, but a motorcycle unexpectedly appears on the road and crashes into the Bentley and shatters the windshield. Sinclair swerves and shoots at the tires of the police car, which falls off a cliff and crashes as a result. Soon, however, more marauders, led by Saul, appear on the road. Eden decides to turn around and head straight for the convoy of savages at breakneck speed. They have no choice but to dodge the car to avoid a collision. Eden turns the car around again and heads for the border, while the savages continue the chase and soon catch up with the Bentley. Saul manages to jump into the car. Sinclair and Sterling are forced to fight the mad Saul and keep control of the car. Saul grabs Eden's gun and tries to shoot her, but accidentally shoots one of the motorcyclists. Many cannibals' cars crash and explode in the frantic pursuit. Sinclair and Sterling manage to push Saul out of the car, but he climbs onto the roof and tries to strangle Eden. Suddenly a marauder bus swerves across the road and blocks the path. The savages shoot multiple blades at the Bentley, but Eden has no plans of stopping. She rams the bus at full speed and decapitates Sola. The Bentley breaks away from the pursuers and approaches the border. A helicopter with the military and Canaris arrives in the area. Eden hands them Kelly and explains that the girl has developed immunity to the virus and that her cells can be used to obtain the necessary vaccine. However, Canaris does not intend to use the vaccine right away. He wants to wait until the pandemic has engulfed the world and has power over the entire planet. Eden refuses to fly with Kelly and Sterling and stays in Glasgow. She heads to her childhood home, where she looks at old photographs and cannot hold back her tears. At the address given in the note, she is found by Nelson, who has flown to Glasgow in another helicopter. 
Eden hands him a disc on which her conversation with Canaris is recorded. She is confident that this recording is enough to bring Canaris to justice. Nelson leaves the area and Sinclair makes her way to the savages. Eden shows them Saul's head and the cannibals welcome her as their new leader. Do you think Eden will really become the leader of the cannibalistic savage gang, or will she go back to her regular life outside the zone? Share your thoughts in the comments, like and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next videos.